pleasure. There we go. Meeting being recorded, apparently, and it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, my, my colleague and um, long-time acquaintance, uh, Professor Ewan, Ewan Cameron. Um, but before I do, um, just some, some basic housekeeping. Um, first of all, um, there, um, if there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, but should you have any questions, you come up, come up straight away whilst Ewan's talk is proceeding. Um, please feel free to put those in the chat function. And um, my colleague um, Lindsay will be monitoring the chat function to ensure that we don't miss your question. Um, but as I say, opportunity to um, to 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 ask questions at the end. Um, also, um, please can I ask you all to um, ensure that your um, your microphone um, is muted um, during the talk. And then finally, we are recording um, this session. You've probably heard that already. Uh, so if you do not wish to appear um, in the recording, please ensure that your camera and microphones are turned. Well, that housekeeping stuff will now um, when I move to, um, to some introductions. And um, as I said already, it gives me um, great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Ewan Cameron um, here today um, to, to talk um, on the uh, early history of our beloved institution. And um, but before we do, um, I would like to pass you over to um, Professor um, Neil Simcoe, um, our Deputy Principal Academic Research, who is going to say um, a few words by way of a more general introduction. Neil. Well, thank Ian Fiskemar, Guy Vula, many thanks Ian and good afternoon everybody. It's a privilege to be here this afternoon to say a very few words um, before uh, our lecture uh, commences. Um, I'm actually here today at Soma Ostig. Um, I'm, uh, I'm actually on leave. I'm here for three weeks uh, brushing up my, uh, my Gaelic, a language which I use uh, every day of my life in my work and in my personal life uh, too. Um, and I suppose um, this afternoon's um, lecture is something that is really important and of great interest to all of us uh, who are part of UHI. Um, and it's a, I think it will be a reminder to us of the, the journey to the foundation of UHI and how critical, critically important um, that is and can, continues to be for the Highlands and Islands and, and beyond. Um, Ian mentioned that my, my role is as Deputy Principal for Academic and Research at UHI, and my role is to oversee all of our research, all of our higher education, and all of our further education across the UHI partnership. And I've been uh, part of the UHI's journey for nearly 15 years now. And to be part of that journey um, is by far the biggest privilege of my uh, career in um, in universities and in education generally. It is a huge privilege to be a leader in UHI. And I suppose, why, why do I say that? Um, because to be a leader in any institution, I think, is a privilege that one should take seriously and, um, and responsibly. But to be a leader in UHI um, has a particular feel, a particular character to it. And I think the reason why it's why this is important is because of the difference that we collectively are making uh, into the communities uh, within the Highlands and Islands region and beyond. Uh, and and it's not only the difference that we're making to communities, but it's the difference we're making to individuals within that community within those communities. And if it were not for UHI, we know that there would still be. A, a brain drain of, 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 of young people and, and older learners to central belt institutions and, 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 and beyond. And of course, today people still have that choice and many, many folks do travel out with the region for their, for their education. 
but but it is also the case that UHI's impact has been transformational on um, individuals, countless individuals throughout the Highlands and Islands. And my mind goes back, uh, some colleagues will know here that I, I live in, in Bona Bridge in Sutherland, and my mind goes back to a graduation a couple of years ago when crossing the stage was one of my neighbor's uh, children. Uh, and in the, um, in the gathering after the graduation, the family said to me, uh, if it was not for UHI, my, um, my child, my young person, uh, would not have been able to access uh, education and therefore would not have been able to enter the workplace uh, with a degree and, you know, in this example, um, to, to, to enable a person to actually flourish in the workplace and make a great contribution to the community and beyond. So it is for these reasons that, uh, it is for these kinds of reasons, that's just a really small vignette, uh, it is for these reasons that UHI um, is important as a community-based university, um, is important and will continue to be important despite the enormous challenges that the university sector is facing in Scotland and beyond uh, right now. So for me, the privilege of being a, being a leader in UHI goes along with the tenacity that is required to lead um, in what what are unprecedentedly unprecedentedly difficult times for universities and colleges throughout Scotland uh, and beyond. So turning so turning to uh, Professor Cameron's lecture, really looking forward to it, uh, you and uh, today, um, because I think your 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 talk will. Um, enlighten us to some of the machinations in the 1990s um, in, in regard to the formation of, of the university. So I'm tremendously, I'm really looking forward to uh, what you've got to say and uh, I think it will be a great, of, of great interest uh, to all of us. So welcome once again, many thanks for coming along and um, I'll hand back to Ian who I think is going to say a few words uh, to introduce Ewan and then perhaps away we go. Thank you very much, Ian. And thank you very much Neil, for, for those um, interesting and very reflective uh, words. Um, so now it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Ewan Cameron, the uh, Sir William Fraser Professor of Scottish History and Paleography at the University of Edinburgh. And Ewan's talk today, focusing as uh, Neil has just said, on the early years of um, UHI, but this talk today um, is a, a strand of his current um, research interest in the history of Scotland's universities more generally. But today, in many respects, you, you mean he's here to talk about um, a university that never was, um, in, in, in that uh, where he begins his story today, I hope I've got this right, is uh, with the um, Inverness campaign for um, Scotland's fifth new university following um, the, the Robbins Report in 1963-64, um, which um, was ended, um, unfortunately, for, um, for, 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 for that period at least, and that campaign at least ended in failure. But no doubt we're going to hear um, lots more of that um, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. So let me pass you over to you. Well, th thanks very much, Ian, and, uh, and colleagues, and thank you, Neil, for for those um, very powerful uh, opening opening words. And I suppose I should respond to them by saying I'm exactly one of those people who constituted the brain drain in the sense that I went to, I grew up and I went to school down in in Inverness, at Milburn Academy, and uh, disappeared off to to Aberdeen University in, in 1985. And I'm afraid I've I've never I've never come back. Uh, maybe that's a good thing um, for for the north of Scotland. I, I don't I don't know. Um, so I've watched um, UHI from from afar, developing into the institution that Neil's very um, uh, eloquently described. Um, and I've been involved a little bit on the inside. I remember about twenty years ago, maybe a little bit more, being involved in the days of the Open University Validation Schemes. Um, the OUVS validation service, I think it was sitting on 
I can't remember the acronym now, was it, was it IVs and EV panels uh, for, for various various degrees. And, and what, getting a chance to see that stage of UHI uh, from, from the inside, which was, was, was interesting. Um, so it, it takes a, a special kind of arrogant idiot to, to come up to, to a university and, and about their own about their own history. So I, I apologize. And this paper in a way is not so much about, about UHI uh, itself, but about the, the government and the, the Scottish officers' response uh, to it. Um, so so as, as Ian has said, the idea of, of the university in the Highlands and Islands is, is a long-standing one. Um, prior to the campaign that led to the, the current UHI, which we know and love, the most concerted attempt uh, came, as Ian was saying, in the immediate aftermath of the Robbins Report of 1963, which had recommended the creation of an additional Scottish university. Inverness was one of several towns that made bids to the University Grants Committee uh, to be the favoured site. The others were Dumfries, Ayr, Cumbernauld, which was a new town, Falkirk, Stirling and Perth. That the choice was Stirling came as a huge disappointment to the Inverness campaigners, but not perhaps to the venerable Inverness Courier, uh, which had been deeply opposed uh, to the creation of a university in, in Inverness. Um, it's worth emphasising, I think, that, that what was sought in 1964 was exactly that, a university in, a university of Inverness. Although the documentation, um, the campaign's documentation, which you can look at in the National Archives in Kew, uh, makes reference to the wider Highlands and Islands region. This was an age, of course, of university expansion, um, and although Stirling was the only completely new post robins creation, Strathclyde and Harriet Watt, long-standing sort of technical colleges, higher technical colleges, were raised to university status, although they'd been on the UGC's list for many years. Dundee, uh, recovered its independence, if you like, from St Andrews across the River Tay. Um, wider uh, field, the, the so-called plate glass universities, Lancaster, York, Warwick, Kent, East Anglia, Sussex, Essex, they predated the Robbins report. And interestingly, from a UHI point of view, each of them had emerged from long-standing campaigns located and rooted very much in their, in their locality. Maybe Lancaster is quite close in some senses to, um, to, to UHI in, in, it, in its regional identity in the northwest of England. Robert has also recommended that the colleges of advanced technology, the so-called CATS, um, achieve university status. Since we have the formation of Bradford, Loughborough, Surrey, Salford, Brunel, Bath, Aston, and City, i.e. City of London. Further expansion comes following the 1965 Woolwich speech by Richard Crossman, that initiated the creation of some 30 polytechnics firmly on the other side, the wrong side, maybe as some people saw it, of a binary line, a binary divide from the universities, new and old. And although they were not funded through the, the University Grants Committee, sometimes they're called public sector institutions. And in Scotland, um, the 20th century had seen the development of a series of what were called central institutions, um, and other colleges, colleges of art, education, agriculture, uh, that were, unlike the universities, funded and overseen by the Scottish office. The Scottish universities, ancient and modern, were very firmly part of the British network, overseen by the University Grants Committee. And this was a Britishness that they jealously defended against the threat, as they saw it, of devolution during the 1974-9 period. So, in a sense, then, the mid-1960s may have been a good time, one of optimism and expansion, a good time to establish a university in the Highlands. And the, the, the main book about global university expansion um, in the 60s is called Utopian Universities. It sums it up quite nicely. Nevertheless, just indulge me for a moment or two, um, supposing the UGC had plumped for Inverness in 1964, the institution created would have been a small and conventional university, very different from UHI that eventually emerged. That tide of optimism of the 60s ebbed in the 70s, as many aspects of the benign, even cozy procedures of UGC were undermined by harsh economic conditions. 
and then uh, the brutal cuts of 1981, in which many of the newer universities received harsh treatment from the UGC, of course, so did some older ones like, like my own university of Aberdeen. Who knows how Inverness may have fared in that environment? Perhaps then, although promised Wotherspoon and other campaigners ruled 1964 as a missed opportunity, maybe in some senses it might have been a blessing in, in disguise, maybe very effectively disguised, but that's a little bit. So in reviewing the material relating to the 1990s campaign for a UHI, it's striking how often the memory of the 1964 disappointment was, was referred to. Uh, by both campaigners and Scottish office officials. Implicitly then, those campaigning saw their work as a chance to correct a perceived mistake of a generation before. Uh, government officials, of course, didn't quite see it that way, uh, as will become uh, clear. So the purpose of, of my, my paper today is to examine the attitudes and the shifting positions of, of the Scottish office to, to the UHI campaign. I'm not attempting anything like an assessment of the wider history of that, of that campaign. There's many people in the, the room who are involved and know much more about it than, than I do. So my apparent narrow focus stems from this wider project that Ian referred to about the historical relationship between the universities and the British state, uh, between the Scottish universities and the British state. Well, obviously, I've done a little bit of work on the relationship between the Highlands more broadly and, and the, the, the self-same British state. <laughs> And just one further contextual point before I really dive in. In the, in the 1960s, the Scottish office actually had very limited agency in the post robbins deliberations and in higher education in general. The University Grants Committee, the UGC, which was a treasury committee, moved in 1964 to the new Department of Education and Science, was, was in fact the main player. The UGC was an arm's length body. Uh, that made the decisions on grants to, to the universities. Its role was to do so in a way that preserved institutional autonomy and academic freedom in an age when state funding to higher education was increasing. It was often seen, or is often seen, as a buffer or a coupling uh, between the state and, and the universities. And uh, compared to, to the contemporary funding scene, the, the touch was, was incredibly light um, and, and funding decisions were taken on a five-year cycle, the so-called quinquennial cycle. Um, and, and having been a university manager for a while um, over the last few years, looking back to the light touch of the UGC, almost, almost the amount of money that was, that was flooding into the system always makes you want to weep. Uh, but uh, never mind. We'll, we'll move on. <laughs> um, although the, the, the UGC the quinquennial system collapsed in the late 1970s under the pressure of, of inflation. There was, there was an almost complete absence of audit. And anybody who's been a university manager or involved in any aspect of the university finds over the last 30 years finds it difficult to, to understand. So audit, you know, such an ungentlemanly idea uh, <laughs> would, in the view of, of UGC and the universities, compromise the all-important and closely guarded concept of institutional autonomy. And this landscape changed in the late 1980s when the UGC was abolished, replaced by the short-lived and deservedly forgotten universities funding council. Um, and then with the abolition of the binary divide in 1992, the effective devolution of all Scottish higher education, including the universities, to the Scottish office with the creation of Shefka also maybe deservedly forgotten, the Scottish Higher Education Funding Council. Um, and that was in 1992. And the legislation of that year uh, would become highly germane to, to UHI, as will become clear, um, as it mapped out a potential route to designation as a higher education provider under Section 44 of that Act. This was the context in which the campaign for UHI was operating in the early, in the early 90s. So I want to look then at three phases of the UHI campaign, although I'll maybe only dwell properly on, on two of them um, in the interest of time, um, and the Scottish office response. I want to look first of all at the immediate appearance of UHI on the agenda in the early 90s with the activities of Highland Regional Council and uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, 
promoting the idea. I want to look at the change in the landscape when uh, Michael Forsyth became Secretary of State for Scotland in 1995 and what this meant for UHI, because there's a, there's a thesis out there about, about Forsyth. Um, and finally, if I have time, um, the debates over designation as a provider of higher education in the late 90s. Um, and this last point ties in ties to which I have very long running debates about the governance of universities in Scotland. And maybe I'm the only person interested in, in that, but um, it's, it's quite it's quite significant. <clears throat> so let's look at this first phase then. And UHI makes its first appearance in the Scottish office, Scottish office archive in the later months of 1990. And a property developer, Samir Matar, claimed to wish to add a campus university to a housing development uh, just south uh, east of Inverness. This came as a big surprise to the Scottish Education Department in Edinburgh and an official in the still significant education department in London, Department of Education and Science, found it difficult to take uh, Matar, Matar seriously. Even if this was a fair assumption, it's worth noting that the flurry of press interest helped to put the issue back on the agenda. But of course, the landscape, I mean, Neil referred to the, the current landscape as, as being very difficult, which of course is, um, but the landscape of the late 80s, early 90s was, was also very difficult. Um, the Times Higher Education uh, supplement noted, um, Inverness is still seen as too small and too far away at a time when existing universities and central institutions are uh, starved of resources. Any proposal to create another is bound to be treated with scepticism. The general prejudice is that Scotland has too many institutions, not too few. Nevertheless, undaunted, Highland Regional Council and some particular councillors, including Valerie McKeever, took action by setting up a steering group. But even they acknowledged that, and I quote, the prospect of establishing a university is somewhat remote. The most likely route to seeing a, a higher education presence in the North at that time was seen by some to be by building relationships with existing universities to deliver higher education in the FE colleges around the Highlands. Inverness College, that is, entered into such a relationship with Stirling. And the, I think he was Orcadian, the principal of Napier, um, Bill Termo, uh, was a strong um, advocate of such a device. And, and Harriet Watt University were also um, interested at this time. This is what Robin Lingard and Graham Hills in their book about UHI have called the colonising model of university creation. Perhaps similar in some ways to the role played by the University of London in its external validation of English universities in the from the 30s to the, to the 50s. Nevertheless, the, the higher, um, Highland Regional Council HIE steering group under Val McKeever commissioned the former Strathclyde principal, Sir Graham Hills, to report on the potential, and they sought contact with the Scottish Education Department, which began to take place in 1992. Hill argued for what he called a federal model with a weak and unbureaucratic centre what he called the Parliament model. Um, Scottish Education Department, SED, negativity was immediately, immediately apparent. <laughs> Hill's report was, and I quote, highly impressionistic. The model was highly diffuse, shortage of adverbs in the Scottish office. Uh, the social and cultural arguments were, were weak. Uh, Scottish office officials articulated general support for expansion of higher education in the Highlands, but total opposition to the creation of a new institution of any kind, federal or otherwise. And I quote again, um, the campaigners should look neither for commitment nor for funding support from the Scottish office, the Scottish office view. The SET recognised that the emotional appeal, that word crops up a lot, emotional, that is, of a Highlands University would ensure that the pressure on ministers, especially Lord James Douglas Hamilton, the late Sir uh, Lord James, uh, who was then sort of Minister for the Highlands, um, the pressure on the ministers would be would be sustained. Now here I read emotional, people will disagree maybe, but I don't know, I read emotional as a, as a synonym for irrational. Um, but Lord James was told uh, any endorsement told by civil servants, that any endorsement of the creation of a new university was mm. unthinkable. Aside from the institutional gut feeling in the SED, there were also arguments from the point of view of the current, 
or the then current public expenditure uh, constraints, which were which were very uh, very tight. Uh, Fraser Morrison, I uh, was told by, by Ian Lang, the then Secretary of State for Scotland, Fraser Morrison, the businessman who was chair of HIE, uh, was told that it would be premature and prejudicial to the development of higher education in the Highlands for them to make any commitment. So you can see the kind of language that's, that's coming through. At this point, the SED was aware that the 1992 Act provided the Secretary of State for Scotland with powers to designate a higher education institution and thereby put it on the Shefka list for funding. But whether this was the right way to proceed in the case of UHI was, was a different matter, a civil servant noted. So much is possible, but I fear much less is desirable. There is a sense in which creating a brand new institution is directly antithetical, inconsistent with institutional autonomy. If a new institution were to develop naturally out of existing institutions, then that would be different. So even this tiny flicker of, of positivity was mitigated by an injunction that Shefka should stick to higher education funding rather than higher ed, further ed, uh, hybrid institutions. The secretary of the SED, a man called Jerry Wilson, told Val McKeever in August 92 that the idea of creating a new institution was premature. And he admitted to colleagues that she was disappointed at my negative reaction. The Scottish office were also very concerned about the role of HIE in this project. Robin Lingard, um, former civil servant, former full-time member of the Highland Board, Highlands and Islands Board, he took the lead on UHI matters for, for HIE. And his PR material, it's very interesting actually, it, it really had the capacity to irk uh, the SED, which may not be very far from his, his intention perhaps. Um, but in using their resources to promote the project, HIE could contrive, sometimes contrive to give the impression that UHI actually had Scottish office support, which it did not, of course. Issue number two of the publication UHI News, published in April 1993, was especially irksome in St Andrew's House. It did contrive to give the impression that UHI was, in their views, an actuality that exists. <clears throat> And this really annoyed the civil servants. The same official reminded colleagues that the Scottish office had agreed to lodge with the Privy Council objections to Highland Regional Council's proposal to establish a company with the business name Project for University of the Highlands and Islands. The same official, I wouldn't name actually, but she was the most consistently negative of all those who appear in the files, concluded, I'm, I'm sorry to be so negative. She does, actually. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to be so negative, but she was worried that ministers would be trapped by the HIE strategy, which was to push the UHI, UHI idea so hard that they achieve a fait accompli. And she went on, unless or until ministers take the view that the University of the Highlands and Islands is to be positively encouraged, I cannot abet the team's aspiration. It's worth dwelling on that verb for a minute. I actually looked it up. And to abet something is to encourage or assist someone to do something that is wrong. Another major development in this period then uh, was the award of funding uh, to the Highlands under Objective 1 from the European community for underdeveloped areas. Now the Scottish office worked very hard um, to, to try to ensure that such monies could not be used for the UHI project. To be fair for a moment, but only that. Uh, this was in line with, with the UK government position that education and training shouldn't be funded by, by structural funds. Hills and Lingard uh, spotted the opportunity and they spent time in Brussels where they impressed the, the UK's permanent representative to the EC, although he admitted that the UHI quote did not look good on paper. But football's played on grass, as Bill Shankly used to say. <laughs> um, the evidence of this period of the UHI project in terms of the Scottish office attitude is, is very clear. So it's come through, hopefully. Um, it's one of relentless negativity. Relentless negativity to the idea of creating a new university. Lip service was paid to the idea of general development of higher education in the Highlands through arrangements with existing colleges. But it was clear that the SED were very 
aware that this did not meet the aspirations of those working so hard on the UHI project. Robin Lingard, uh, I, I don't know Mr. Mr. Lingard, so, um, a very interesting man. Uh, Robin Lingard at times affected to be understanding of the Scottish office position, indicating that the work towards building a network of colleges was in line with the Scottish office position. But he also urged that the Scottish office desist from negative press briefings about the project. And he remarked in a, in a letter to, to the SED, um, he said, well, ag agnosticism is one thing, militant atheism is, is quite another. <laughs> and indeed, the Scottish office were militant, militantly uh, atheistic about the project. So, so much for, for official policy. What about more subtle indications? Well, they're not actually very subtle, but um, <laughs> what about, I've written more subtle indications, so that's what I'll read out, um, that, that reveal the, the tone of more um, internal attitudes in the in the SED. Two small examples, and I really mean this, I really hope this doesn't upset anyone who is involved in the, in the project. Two very small examples provide significant evidence of the level of hostility. So in, in 1994, UHI made their first advertisement for, for a post, which was for an IT coordination manager. The advert was published in Herald newspaper on the 2nd of December 1994, and one official minuted suggesting that this was UHI upping the ante. The advert was copied in the file, and an official minuted and manuscript um, uh, from today's Herald, from today's Herald joke of the month, and went on to write, it's one thing to push this fantasy locally, but quite another to advertise it nationally in this manner. It's almost like the sort of thing now, I guess, it would be, it would be said in a, in a WhatsApp, but it was actually written um, in the files. The WhatsApp, of course, would be deleted, but, um, <laughs> uh, but it was written in the files, and the files there for a dry as dust people like me to read. A further example in, in 1993, um, Jerry Wilson of the SED uh, met with Hills and reported on this meeting to, to his colleagues, noting that Hills had played down the research function of the new institution. And again, there's a marginal manuscript comment, I can't work out who it's by on, on Wilson's letter. He said, if it plays down research, then it cannot be a university as we know, as we now understand the term and as the government have defined it. And a further comment in a different hand said that the raison d'etre was to draw investment to the area by providing R&D facilities, exclamation mark. The extent of the negativity and the pessimism of the Scottish office can be seen in the comment of an industry department official in July 1993, responding to the submission of a report by the economics consultancy uh, PIEDA, I don't know if it's PEDA, uh, anyway, under Professor Donald Mackay, which seemed to ignore the official government position. Although some officials thought this report was more realistic than Graham Hill's report, um, the, the, the civil servant, uh, the industry department civil servant wrote. Um, and again, this is you know, an um, interesting view. I, I remain of the view that it should not be the Scottish office who are seen to kill off this initiative. It is an emotional issue, that word again, in the Highlands and Islands, where the idea of having a local university is widely supported. Open-minded scepticism, which leaves local interests to make the best they can of an unpromising hand, keeps our options open. I think it would be premature to engineer a confrontation between the promoters and the Secretary of State over their report. So just let's stop for a moment and think, why were they so, so hostile? I can think of maybe five or six reasons. First of all, UHI was unusual in that it wasn't an FE college, a central institution seeking to step up to university status through the 1992 Act. So it was different from the other institutions. I think they couldn't quite get their heads around that, I don't think. The weather environment at the time was, was difficult. There's no question about that. Although the binary line had been abolished, lots of central institutions Robert Gordon, et cetera, be made universities. There was still a strict limit on the number of HE places. And there was a worry that UHI would displace students and cut into a limited pot of money. Scotland was arguably over-provided with higher education places, of course, with, with eight. 
institutions even prior to the, the 1992 changes. So that's maybe the second reason. The third reason, I think, is that they were worried about the setting a precedent if UHI was designated as a kind of special case. Although Robert Gordon, Napier, Glasgow Cali, etc., had been raised to university status, um, Aberté, or what became Aberté, had their application had been rejected because it was seen as too small. And uh, the Scottish authors were worried about the Aberté campaigners making, um, taking it to legal review. There were also other proposals around at the time, Bell College in Hamilton, which was an FE college, but lots of higher education students. Um, and there was a very interesting, um, which I don't remember at all, where St Andrews University um, were, were in play to set up a university college on the site of the former Ravenscraig uh, steel plant. Nothing seemed to have come of that, but these things were in the, in the ether at the time. Fourth reason, I think the Scottish office were quite new to dealing with higher education, as I explained at the beginning. Formerly, was the, the preserve of the Department of Education and Science via the UGC and the UFC. So the Scottish office had a much of a track record of dealing with, with higher education issues. Further, perhaps the arguments being used by UHI, arguments about regional economic development, arguments about cultural identity, were regarded with particular scepticism in the Scottish office. And the Scottish education department was perhaps not very well equipped to judge, particularly the economic reasons, but they did have advice from the industry department and indeed the two departments were merged in, in 1995. Um, I think I'm on to my sixth reason now, uh, as the minister <laughs> used to say. Um, there was no political leadership, I think, and this is crucial. Um, there were no political leadership from ministers in the Scottish office. Um, Ian Lang and, and Lord James were, were not really interested, frankly, and, and perhaps this meant that an innate resistance to change in the civil service was allowed to run unhindered. Also, I think, and this is difficult to kind of put my finger on, but also the kind of insurgent tone of the UHI campaign, maybe it, it, it didn't help. Um, there were over claiming, I think, which all campaigning organizations do. You have to overclaim, I think. It's very similar. I spent a bit of time recently looking at the Falkirk campaign um, in 1963-64, um, run by a man called Robert Duncan, who was a, a local official in Falkirk. And it had a similar insurgent tone, similar unconventional ideas, and it, it was equally uh, irksome to, to, to the officials. So we've got this first phase then, which is one of intense hostility. Clearly then, if, if things had continued in this vein, there, there would be no UHI today. Clearly, um, sorry, I'm running out of adverbs as well. Clearly, it took a long time to achieve full universal status. But, but in the mid nineties, there was the prospect of a, of a complete dead end to, to the project. What, what changed? Well, in some senses, nothing changed in, in, at the level of, of the campaign. The, the, the dedicated people, some of them in the room today, continue to campaign um, hard and to, to drive the idea and to build coalitions uh, locally and to, to continue uh, banging their head against, against a, a brick wall, really. But political leadership is, I think, one, one argument. Um, both in the book by Graham Mills and uh, Lingard and in Dave Ross's um, memoir, um, which touches on, on UHI, they credit Michael Forsyth with very significant agency in, in changing the landscape. So what, what do the official records reveal about, about this? Well, initially there's evidence of, of continuing caution. Uh, Forsyth became Secretary of State in mid -19. exemplifies this. I'm not sure if this letter was ever sent, but um, he said, I need to take into account the issues of need and affordability against the very tight constraints of public expenditure. I think that was written by one of his officials rather than by himself. Nevertheless, he signed it. Um, in the same month, however, at a meeting in the, um, the Kings Mills Hotel in Inverness, no less, um, with the Inverness and District Chamber of Commerce, Forsyth signalled a, a slightly different tone. The official account of the meeting is quite revealing and is worth, is worth quoting a wee bit of length. 
Uh, so the minute says that the Secretary of State, i.e. precise, acknowledged that the Scottish Office had not so far responded favourably to the proposal, not least in view of doubts about the project's financial viability. He said, however, that he had been much impressed by what he had seen at the Gaelic College in Skye as an example of what might be achieved. He noted the evident enthusiasm of people throughout the Highlands for what appeared to be a genuine renaissance in the fortunes of the area. In that context, he said, he would be very interested to see a fully costed and viable set of proposals for a university. This was a very different tone to what had been in evidence before. Several months before his public statement at the Scottish Grand Committee meeting in February 1996, I think also in spring 96, he gave a, a lecture at Williamson Memorial Lecture at the University of Stirling, where he was very positive um, about it. The Scottish Grand Committee meeting took place in Inverness, and it, it generated much positive press comment, including a held uh, editorial which said that UHI was, and I quote, a promise that now can't be withdrawn. In a letter to Hills in February 96, it's got a similar tone. For Cy Throne, since returning to the Scottish office, I've been struck by the impressive achievements in recent years of the Highlands and Islands. I am anxious to do what I can to promote the interests and welfare of the area. Improving the quality of education and training is a key aspect, and I'd certainly be interested to hear more of your views on how we can improve access to higher education in the area. It's all very interesting, you know, mood, music, intangibles. Um, but he followed up, I think, with some practical contributions. Uh, £500,000 for UHI IT development, £200,000 for a curriculum and staff development fund. And in December 1996, funding of about £16 million over four years was awarded to UHI. Also very significant was a less heralded move, so a technical move, to lift the cap on HE student numbers in UHI FE colleges. And that took place in 1996-7. And this helped, I think, UHI work towards the relevant number of higher education students, which was one of the criteria for designation as an HEI um, at, the, at the then designation. So that helped UHI a realistic prospect of, of meeting those, those criteria. The other major development of this period were that the two bids by the UHI project to, to the Millennium Commission. Initially, the, the Scottish office were, were rather unsure about this. But over the period between the two bids, April and December 95, it came to be seen as, a, as an opportunity. In March 95, an official worried that it would be very embarrassing if UHI got Millennium Commission money and then couldn't follow through to qualify for Shefka funding. And he went on to say, from our point of view, it would undoubtedly be for the best if HIE would drop the overt policy of establishing a university. This is very probably beyond a prayer, but they should at the very least be aware of the embarrassment they will inevitably cause to ministers. So despite the size positivity, the civil servants are still, still working away. The initial bid wasn't successful, and a revised bid was submitted later in the year. And this was at a point at which the policy of so-called consolidation of HE places in Scotland in the UK as a whole, in fact, was, was in place. And ministers were reminded um, that uh, if the projected 2,500 FTE places that UHI was working towards, that would generate substantial increased pressures and divert resources from elsewhere in Scotland. The Scottish Office at this stage was aware that it had a difficult line to, to tread with the Millennium Commission. They knew that there was potential for them to be successful um, and to inject tens of millions of pounds into the project. And this would make it very awkward for Scottish Office officials to do or to be seen to do anything other than to, to make it work. On the other hand, Departments, government departments, were not supposed to be consulted on Millennium Commission bids, so the politicians or officials couldn't interfere with the work of the Commission, nor use national <coughs> funds to substitute for public sector funding of projects. But, on the other hand, since Millennium Commission grants had to be matched by exchequer funding, 
departments were expected to indicate whether this was realistic, which could in turn then influence bids. So there's kind of circularity uh, going on here. Scottish Office Education and Industry Department, uh, after the merger, were also aware that some in the Millennium Commission were resistant to bids for higher education projects because this area was one that government were expected to fund through regular expenditure. There was also a concern that UHI could set precedent for other projects, uh, such as those in Cornwall and in Cumbria, and I know that, that Neil Simcoe was involved in, in, the, in the latter. The second Millennium Commission bid was, of course, uh, successful. Despite the diplomacy surrounding the bid and the role of the Scottish Office in maintaining an arm's length from it, it seems difficult to think that the bid would have been successful without the general sense of political commitment to the UHI project. If the mood music remained the type evident prior to precise appointment, it's plausible that the bid would not have been successful. It's also quite clear, I think, that the position of the Scottish Office was made explicit to Millennium Commission officials through the bid document and through contact uh, between officials. So I think the success of the Millennium Commission bid was a major turning point. Hills and Lingard recount waiting for the fax machine in Caledonia House. Um, some people may not remember Caledonia uh, House, which, uh, as I was saying to Andrea, is now a, a hotel on um, Academy Street in Inverness, but it was then the, the, the top two floors, I think, were, were the executive office of, of UHI hung out at that, at that stage. So Hills and Lingard are, are you know, they're kind of waiting for the fax machine. Um, I think we're all of a generation, we know what a fax machine is, um, to, 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 to spring into action with, with the result, which was, of course, positive. And the award of uh, sub, sub, over £30 million uh, put the project onto, onto a new footing. So neither the political leadership of Forsyth or a more constructive approach by, by officials the Millennium Commission money, or indeed the election of the Labour government in 1997 with a commitment to support UHI, made the successful conclusion of the project inevitable. And the continuing campaign um, in the Highlands was, of course, absolutely uh, crucial. All those things, however, did make it possible. And although it took longer than the UHI project expected, but not so much longer than many officials thought in the post 97 period, um, the final section of the paper, which I'll go over very quickly, looked at debates over the question of designation as a higher education institution and the issue of university title. And I think that the atmosphere here is, is quite striking. Although there were many disagreements in this period, some of them profound and increasing tensions, I think, within the UHI project between the colleges and, and, and UHI. Um, and there was a new UHI company or a revised company as memorandum and articles of association were revised in the late 1990s to give it a chance of being designated. And there was, I think, a more constructive approach and the hostility recounted in the first part of this paper was, was a thing of the past. The shift was gradual, but the direction of travel, I think, is unmistakable in the evidence of the files which I've, I've, I've looked at here. So the debate moved on and there was lots of discussion about, about designation and I'll, I'll pre-see this section of the paper. So the UHI thinking at this time was to try to appeal to the Privy Council in London for a, a royal charter um, and to go for university status that way. I think the tactic was that they thought that that would possibly circumvent some of the more technical criteria that were important for designation under Section 44 of the, of the 1992, uh, 1992 Act. Um, the UHI constantly argued this, the Scottish Office constantly argued for, for Section 44, which would allow them to, 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 to have more control over the, over the process. Um, the company UHI had been had been registered, and th this is another sort of almost you could make a an episode of the Yes Minister about this. There was a debate about what UHI Limited stood for. What did the U stand for? And there was a, there was a sort of they, they all came to a convenient fictional agreement 
that it did not stand for university. Because <laughs> the, the, the word university, with a capital U, is, is very strictly controlled by, by the Privy Council. And I, I think I can actually find my, my notes here because I came across it just, um, well, maybe, I, maybe I can't. Um, but there's something like, you know, the U doesn't stand for university. It's, it's just an acronym, UHI. It could easily be ABC or XYZ. <laughs> um, so, so this is the tone. It's, we're moving into a, a debate about a more, more technical arrangements, I think. Um, I thought there was still um, the prospect for, for UHI campaigners to introduce apoplexy in the, in the Scottish office. Um, so Graham Hills at one stage sent a note uh, to an official um, saying that he was christening his new note paper and the official wrote back, um, there can be no christening of note paper or anything <laughs> else um, and advised them to, to contact the Privy Council um, about the use of the title uh, university. Um, so there's, there's a lot, this is what the debate is about in the in the late 90s. There's, there's also an argument going on about the relationship between UHI and the colleges, very complex relationship, which I'm, I'm perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure I've got my head around. Um, but it was essentially about what UHI was, what, what constituted UHI. And if UHI was designated as the higher education provider, um, what, what was the role of the colleges and would they cede their, their autonomy or their control over, um, over, the, over the project? So there was a long, long debate um, about, about that. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to, to, to sum up um, now some, some conclusions. Um, so I think there are clearly three phases here, a, a phase of hostility. Um, a phase of, of political leadership um, and a phase, finally, of, of technical engagement. And by the third phase, and although it took a very long time before UHI was, was fully constituted as a university in, I think, 2011, I hope that's, I hope that's correct, I think, and maybe I'm being over-optimistic here, but I, I think UHI was on a pathway to establishment. I think the Scottish office sometimes use the word a long incline, but I think they did see it as being at the at the foot of, of that long incline. And although there was some scenario planning for, for failure, it seems unlikely that, that the Scottish office would have constituted failure. So what, what would they have done with the 33.9 million pounds of the Millennium Commission grant? Well, if, if, if the project had failed, they had to pay it back. And, no, I don't see that happening. And meanwhile, the campaign was going on and, and UHI was getting on with it. Um, the new uh, Quality Assurance Agency had been set up in 1997, and this provided another sort of criteria. Designation became less about numbers and a little bit more about this intangible um, issue of, of quality. And they were engaged with the Open University Validation Service, as I say, to, to validate uh, degrees. Some of those validation events were 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 quite uh, were were quite uh, robust, as, <laughs> as, as I recall. Um, and of course, they were getting on with the business of of, of teaching students. So, so university UHI people were just just getting on with it, whilst all this this politics was was going on. My second sort of conclusion is: I think a lot of the difficulties. This is maybe a tautology, but. I think many of the difficulties stemmed from, from mutual incomprehension. UHI, as I said earlier, didn't fit the usual models. It wasn't an FE college or central institution building up. It wasn't a university college achieving independence like Southampton or Reading or Hull or those, those sort of institutions. It wasn't an ab initio campus institution like Stirling or Lancaster or um, East Anglia. So it was a bit different. Um, and the Scottish office also had minimal experience of higher education in the early 90s. And they weren't quite sure what to make, I think, of an, this insurgent campaign based on regional development arguments, based on arguments about cultural identity and long historical um, grievance in the, in the Highlands. 
There was also, I think, in comprehension about the unconventional university model that UHI campaigners were proposing based on technology, or video conferencing technology in those days, you probably all remember VC bridges and, and things like things like that. And Graham Hills, many of the campaigners, maybe, you know, they constantly emphasized that that point. And I think the Scottish office were maybe trapped in a conventional model of what a university looked like. It looked a bit like, I don't know, it looked a bit like, I mean, no, the, the, the Scottish university is very diverse. You know, Glasgow Cali is very different from my university, Edinburgh, or St. Andrews, but, but there, there's a certain conventionality about those existing institutions, and which I was different. So I think there's a bit of mutual incomprehension there. Thirdly, um, and I'm not going to get into trouble here. Thirdly, I think we need to think about the role of HIE and, and Highland Regional Council. And clearly, there were some powerful individuals, you know, Val McKeever, Robin Lingard, Fraser Morrison in his, in his own way. But in those institutions, let's think of those institutions, HIE, Highlands Islands Enterprise, and, and the Highland Regional Council, this is before council reorganization in the mid 90s. Um, very, very powerful contribution to to the um, to to the campaign. Now, would, would this be possible today with with the uh, more or less emasculation of of these organisations in the in the post devolution phase? I'm, I'm not sure. And and on the <coughs> point of devolution, there's a really interesting, almost throwaway comment in Hills and Lingard's book about about UHI. Where they say, would, would this have been possible uh, post evolution? Uh, could, could those decisions have been taken? Could that moment of political leadership in the mid 90s, with Forsyth throwing his enthusiasm behind this, throwing his enthusiasm behind one or two other things as well in, in academic life, in the Scottish history of the Scottish Parliament project, i.e., the pre 1707 Parliament, um, which he also um, uh, pushed? You know, could this have happened post devolution? I think most of the big decisions were taken, many big decisions were taken before devolution, but would it have been possible with, a, with the Scottish Parliament? There would have been more scrutiny from politicians and perhaps an even more uh, complex bureaucracy. And finally, I think it says something about the relationship between officials, civil servants, and, and politicians and who drives policy. It says something about the, the, the kinds of relationships and the agencies, agency between the Highlands Islands and, and Scotland, a central government in, you know, in a Scottish context. Um, and sort of apocryphal profter who told Brian Wilson in, in 1979 that he didn't want devolution because they might ignore us in London, but they, they, they really hate us in, in, in Edinburgh. You know, that kind of um, argument coming through and, the, and the, the suspicion that you see between the, the campaigners and the, and the, and the civil servants. What does this tell us about, about a bigger uh, picture? Oh, well, that, that's essentially what, what the files say about the UHI campaign in the in the 1990s. The files run out in the in the late 1990s and digging around in the in this, uh, the, the National Records of Scotland, that's what it's called this week, I think, um, is, um, you know, it doesn't reveal, there might be more stuff buried in, in files that are not explicitly titled, um, and I'll, I'll continue to, 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 to work away. Um, but um, the picture that I've, I've kind of described, or where this is descriptive as a paper, um, is, is, is what I've, I've discovered and, and I wanted to share with this audience uh, first before I share it with anyone else. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ewan. Uh, for, for those of us um, who, who are currently at the cold face of UHI, and that there were some very interesting resonances uh, in, in what you have to say. So, so thank you very much. And I am absolutely sure that there will be some, uh, some, some questions out there. So I shall throw questions out both to the room and um, online as well. If you um, have questions, oh gosh, there's quite a lot here. 
um, either by chat or by raising your hand, please do so um, now. Otherwise, is there anything in the room that some people would like to ask? I, I, can I start? Yes. Thank you very much. Jill. That was that was really interesting. I worked at UCAS for many many years, and during the nineteen nineties, we had um, UHI Millennium Institute, whichever name you mm -hmm. thought at the time, coming on, and, and to have some background on that was really really useful. I have to say, we were <laughs> amazed and intrigued by the thought of this university in the Islands of Islands, and particularly by the use of OBC. And it was a challenge to an organisation which thought it was quite technologically forward, but patently wasn't, as mm -hmm. in UCAS, uh, because we very rarely managed to hook up properly with people at UHI. So we did come up <laughs> to the offices here. Um, but thank you very much for the background. I think if we had that at the time, we, we would have been a bit more understanding about what was trying to be done. So thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that back to my former colleagues now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. All right. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Ian. That was absolutely, absolutely wonderful to listen to that. Uh, and I just want to make three comments. Um, first of all, you actually described quite well what was going on. I came to UHI in 2002 um, as secretary. And, um, you described very well what was going on in the heads of people who were running UHI at the time. Um, some of the things you said I didn't know about, um, but the, the picture you painted was what was in our heads when we were running it. Uh, secondly, I want to say to you was um, the files, I think the government files will be quite tricky because there were. I don't, must be very careful what I say because almost everybody I might offend is living, but um, <laughs> still. Um, there, was, there was a lot of stuff went on that may never have reached the end. Yeah. And um, I think it's really important that whilst those of us who live through our period are still alive, somebody asks us about yeah. that. Uh, I'm certain some very critical things you wouldn't find in the files. Promises that were made and broken, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there'll be a lot of stuff in the QA files. There'll be a lot of stuff in UHI files uh, because there was a lot of uh, notes and minutes and letters that were faithfully copied in. Uh, if they haven't been destroyed, as this record seems to be stated, uh, they'll still be there. And there'll be a lot of stuff, I think, in the SF chef did. Mm. And SFC files. Um, and the third thing I want to say was just for your interest, I'm really looking forward, if I live long enough, to looking at the next period, the after, after designation. And I just wanted to amuse you all by telling you that the um, opposition is still alive and well, mm. and occasionally they got the uh, Occasionally, the curtain was lifted, and you understood that there were lots of people still against the project in the 2000s. Um, one document I don't think I have, but I'll now go and look for it. Because one of the critical interventions, and I looked it up, so I don't have the right thing, it came in autumn, um, came in 2002, and you may have come across this. There was a body called the Convention on the Highlands and Islands, yeah. and it was a talking shop of local authorities, mm -hmm. high and the university, and it met in Oban, a place like that, for a few days. And, and it was an interesting body. And Ian Gray, a government minister, got turns of mm -hmm. chairing this thing. And on 2002, it was Ian Gray's turn. Oh, yeah. And Ian Gray chaired it. And on the agenda was the University of the Highlands and Islands project. Uh, probably the word university even then wouldn't have appeared on the agenda. It is the elusive you. Um, mm -hmm. And a paper was circulated before the meeting. Now, I would love to find this paper in digital form because the paper arrived in the executive office 
and we all opened the paper to read what it said. And this was a civil service paper on the project to back whatever the minister was going to say. And there was some Microsoft technology quirk in the paper. When you turned the print button on, all the corrections appeared in fact in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> The corrections were not only there, they were initial, but the <laughs> And this paper, which was faintly encouraging, when you saw the tracking, um, you saw how encouraging the original version was. Um, and it was hugely embarrassing because, of course, we all were seriously <laughs> in those days printed it out <laughs> before this thing might stop working the way it should be working. Uh, and we all went to we all went to open to hear what was going to be said. Now of course by that time uh, the Scottish office uh, the, the civil servants knew that they'd rumble because we immediately informed them of this more in sorrow than in anger. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Ian Gray uh, stood up now one of the things and the Roger is still alive, this is the chairman of the SFT director. We were not sure at that time that SFC was really committed to the project. And we were absolutely not sure whether the red the director, Roger McClure, was committed to the project. And Roger was a powerful figure in the University of London. Um, and he was sitting inscrutably on the platform beside Ian Gray. And Ian Gray got up and he made an incredibly positive speech. He made the speech that you would have expected to accompany the paper before the civil servants got it. And he virtually instructed SFC to do whatever was necessary to bring the project to fruition. And from that point, the cooperation of Roger McClure was uh, reached a, a new kind of pitch and level that was incredibly helpful to the development of the university. And I hope one day that if history is written of that period, some credit will be given to him because whoever may have been holding him back prior to that point uh, vanished after that point. And he came up with quite a lot of the work runs that were necessary mm -hmm. later to bring the institution into existence. So it's interesting though that the, uh, the opposition survived for so long. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have one question uh, on VC, um, David in the room here as well. If you don't mind, David, we'll, we'll go to Neil first, Neil. Thanks very much, Ian and Ewan. That was, um, that was a really fascinating um, lecture. I hugely enjoyed that and uh, extremely thought provoking. I suppose my, my, I've got a comment. I welcome your, your reflections on, on my comment. What, what I see, what I've seen today is that new evidence um, of the depth of struggle. This is your first phase, particularly to um, create what is now UHI. And, you know, I, in my opening remarks, I mentioned, um, the criticality of UHI uh, to to our region, and it's 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 really interesting to learn uh, more about that depth of struggle. But I suppose my comment is, I'm trying to sort of relate that depth of struggle to the current era, and just as we had a depth of struggle to create the university in the in the 1990s, in the initial stages, it seems to me that today we have we we have to have Again, the depth of commitment required to sustain the university into the future. And what, what I, I suppose what's behind my comment there is right now at this time, we know that there are some, it's a very unstable time in our society. You know, the, po the post COVID um, era, the impact that that has had on education, the, in my view, the disaster of, of leaving Europe and the, the impact of that. Um, obviously, global conflict um, and political turmoil within the UK as well, and within within Scotland uh, specifically. So it seems to me that we're in we're we're in a, a very unstable um, environment right now, and and yet at this time more than any, I would say that the 
um, that the UHI and its profile within the Highlands and Islands and beyond is prevails. It is still of critical Im importance to our our communities. So I just I, I suppose my question really is whether you're able to extrapolate your reflections around the three phases um, into the current era and whether you would have any comments around that. Yes, uh, thanks Neil. Um, I, I think one thing that strikes me, and it, it struck me when, when you were speaking at, at the beginning before the, before the paper, um, and I look back, to, look back to, to the 1960s campaign and, and look through this material and indeed, there was a there was a brief flurry of campaigning in the nineteen seventies. Um, is in a sense there's 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 a strong continuity about the importance of UHI, and I think I got this a bit wrong actually in the, in the paper I wrote about the nineteen sixties. Um, but I think that, that there is a continuity that that the arguments for UHI were were. A, regional development. If you look at Provost Wotherspoon's paper in, in 1962, 3, 4, if you look at the, the stuff that Lingard and Hills and, and others were producing in the in the 90s, and you know the, the, the things that you were you were saying, there, there's a continuity there. The University of the Highlands and Islands is not just about producing good graduates in history or sociology or or, or um, medical science or, or whatever it's it's about making this powerful contribution to to the region mm -hmm. so i think the what i described slightly tongue-in-cheek but not entirely that the insurgent uh to, um, tone or the insurgent quality of of uhi is is absolutely central mm -hmm. to it now i'm not a very good person to to talk about this because I, i've spent my whole career uh, you know, I studied in Aberdeen and, and Glasgow, and I've taught St Andrews and, and Edinburgh. So, you know, Edinburgh is a new university to me, you know, 1583. That's, that's, um, <laughs> so, you know, and, and what you said of COVID is interesting, you know, because during COVID, when I was, I was out of school, you know, and, and the heads of school were gathered by in the early days of COVID. And, and we did have a, a quasi existential discussion in the University of Edinburgh. Um, you know, because our model, like I'm giving away any state secrets here, I mean, our, our model is, is, is heavily based on, on, on recruiting um, our UK and, and uh, for the international and international students. And frankly, my school history classics and archaeology was <laughs> very heavily predicated on, on that. And we were very, very worried that, that the international market in education, sorry to use that word, but would collapse. Mm -hmm. And, and as, a, as a research intensive university, um, we, would, we would be in trouble. Um, and we don't have, I mean, Edinburgh, you know, I, 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 you know, worked there for 30 years and, you know, it's a sort of lovely institution, but, you know, we, we do not have an insurgent, Edinburgh University is not an insurgent <laughs> campaigning organization. It may have been in the post Reformation period. <laughs> has gone so so i think the what what you said there about you know there are real you know issues and, and looking back in 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 the history of, of scottish universities and there were also existential discussions in the early 1980s in sterling even in Aberdeen, um in the in the early 1980s so so the the, the, the i think if UH loses that insurgency, loses that commitment to its region, loses that, that drive for wider regional development. Um, you know, some universities can be universities, you know, it has to be the university in Town X rather than the university of Town X. I think the University of the Highlands and Islands is almost uniquely the university of the Highlands and Islands. And, and if it loses that, it's 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 got problems. Put it that way. So I think I think that's very important. And I think all the campaigners, all the people you know, I talked to Jim Hunter last last week, um you know, Lingard, um Hills, um the, the other people who were involved, um, 
in the, in the campaign I was talking about today, if you look back to the people who were involved in the in the 60s, then you know that that has been a constant, consistent quality. And I think leadership of the institution, and I know you're at a point of transition in, in leadership, but, you know, the leadership of the institution has got to get that, because if you don't get that, then you don't get the institution, it seems to me, from the outside. Thank you very much for your very, very interesting um, comments there, and very interesting too that it actually echoes, or the initial question actually echoes in many respects Magnus Davison's um, question um, up there in the chat. He goes on to talk about UHI stakeholders, and I know that there's questions in the room as well, but it seems to me that maybe that, 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 that there's a question there that can be followed up. Um, in conversation, you know, how can UHI stakeholders best support the journey that we seem to be continuing to be on? Well, perhaps, you know, there might be folks in the room who, who, would, who would like to, <laughs> to respond to that in any, in any way, or um, perhaps it's, it's something that um, well, maybe UHI court could, um, could consider as well. David. Um, related to that, yeah, I was just thinking of the power of what Ewan said and James's response in particular, Neil's response, and the importance of individual testimony to understanding the story. Um, and that's something I've been writing on about for a long time. We need oral history. Some of these individuals you've talked about who were huge, from Val McGeever to Lingard to many others, I'm not going to name them all. They need to be interviewed, yeah. and if we can get that sort of detail, we learn much more about the yeah. insurgent attitudes. Um, I think it's vital, and it has to be done in the next few years. But I did have a follow-up point as well, which is about one word I, that didn't occur in your talk, which I thought was tremendous, was Europe, and I wondered about high objective one status, the idea of a Europe of the regions that was emerging in the late yeah. 80s and early 90s yeah. as a context that yeah. created a sense of cultural self-confidence. Yeah, yeah de definitely. Yeah, no, I, th I think that that's a really important, I think that's a really important context. Um, I mean, the, the, there is, there is a, I mean, the, the, the flurry of activity around the, the award of, of Objective One um, and the, the, the politics around it were were interesting, and you know the, the, a lot of this was coming from from the top. The UK government didn't want educational training to be part of, of Objective One funding, and, and the Scottish office, I think, latched onto that as a way of, of trying to uh, to stymie UHI. Whereas Lingard and Hills saw it as an opportunity, and they, I'd like to find out more about this. They spent a day trip. Uh, in Brussels, and they were also hyperactive, and they, they ran around Brussels. The taxi fare must have been considerable, and and they were, they were having meetings all over the place. And I think they really, even in that short time, and there was this minute back from this man who was the the, the, the UK's official permanent representative to the European Communities. I can't remember his name, but I've got some letters from him in there. Um, you know, who who did say that they that they made a good impression. Um, although he was a bit skeptical about about the project, um, so I think I think Europe was was very very important um, because of course again in in Europe, um, you know surprisingly sometimes uh, you know sometimes you like you know sometimes I used to say so sometimes the University of Edinburgh um, sometimes forgets that there are other universities um, who, who do things that we can learn from. Um, and, and sometimes British universities forget that we talk a lot about internationalization in university life and we pay it lip service, but sometimes you know, there are universities in Europe um, and, and UHI campaigners and those public relations um, sheets that used to prop up in the Scottish office files, um, you know, they, they talk about the, the universities in the, in the northern part of Scandinavia, um, universities in, in, in Iceland and in Denmark and in, in the northern um, maritimes of, of Canada. And I think the campaign drew a lot from trying to avoid the use of the word peripheral, but you know what I mean. The, the universe, there's, a, there's a letter somewhere where it, it says, yeah, they've gone to Tromso and somewhere in Sweden and literally says somewhere unpronounceable in Finland. And um, 
you know, so there was an effort, I think, amongst the campaigners to learn something from those traditions of countries in Europe which are less centralized than, than the UK, which is other than France, probably all of them. So, you know, and in, in, in Germany, I'm right in saying universities are, a, a, you know, they're, they're a state responsibility rather than a central government um, responsibility. And, you know, in all sorts of other parts of the world have very close connections between the localities and, and the universities. Um, so, yes, I think that's a really, that's a really useful reminder uh, Dave, that, that that context is important. Thanks. You know, just see, I have a pen here, which I picked up from my kitchen. University of the Highlands and Islands, European Social Fund, mm. Europe and Scotland, investing in your future. So it's last. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Place that in the, the UHI Museum as a piece of material culture. You know. so I'm aware of at least two more questions. We'll come to you um, in a minute, like they're in BC land, but no, I think you you had a question. Yeah, as well. I, I, when you were speaking, I was just thinking about parallels yeah. in terms of city development yeah. and regional development. Yeah. And it's not on the same scale, it was more limited. But I taught at Manchester Poly yeah. for a long time, which became a mad view. Yeah. Some referred to it as Mickey Mouse University. <laughs> 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 the track, I think, the other, uh, yeah. But the point the one thing that was really interesting about that point in time in the late uh, uh, mid to late nineteen nineties was the way in which the Poly Cum University defined itself in terms of the region. Yeah, and it was really crucial because Manchester had been run down, as you know. I mean, Cotton had gone. And did research in for a time past of regeneration of, of the region. And this went so far, I mean, at the time people were sort of sceptical about this and the more old-fashioned people were uh, made fun of it but I mean the uh, Manchester met made conscious attempts to forge contacts with Manchester United and Manchester City and develop sports science and, think, and new new subject areas and that, that I think that's been very very important I mean there's one I'll, I'll be quiet now but there's just one other part of that and that is in terms of history. Uh, MMU developed a very, very strong regional identification. And so, I don't know what we really call the Manchester Regional History Review. And there's still a centre of Manchester yeah. Regional History. And that, that was very, very important. Yeah. Um, and the other thing about that, which was quite interesting, was the way it attracted people like Mike Rose from the University of Manchester who became actively involved in it. And there was this sort of crossover of academics between the more far more traditional Manchester University and, and the new university. And I think that continued. One other point, <laughs> again, took me back. This thing about um, quality and purpose. I remember sitting in endless, endless meetings about quality control, progression, coherence, all these, you know, all these things. And what was amazing was that many people at Manchester University had never heard of these things. That's right. You know, have they? I mean, I'm not saying it was a bad thing <laughs> because the managerial, a lot of the managerial. It's managerialism yeah. came from the ex police yeah. into the old university. It's not yeah. but very, very mixed feelings about that. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. Because I mean, the old police, you know, came from a completely different tradition. I mean, many of them have been much more closely associated with local government in their yeah. cities, you know, yeah. funded by local authorities, mm. which made them different. Some people see similarities between the central institutions and the, and the English police, but they're, they're really quite different yeah. Yeah. and i think what you say is i you know forgive me for my own myopia but that that is that is a really powerful point the for most of those universities i'm thinking of you know the lot of the place were set in, in, in urban mm. settings mm. weren't they and, and that commitment to you know particularly in the north of england in, in urban former urban industrial liverpool manchester yeah. leeds so that, that's yeah. 
that's a, a, a really useful additional way of thinking about it. And I, I think you see this as well. You know, I was I was in the nineties, late nineties, early two thousands. I was yeah, is that right? Yeah, I was an external examiner at Glasgow Cali. Um, when Elaine McFarland, Trina McDonald, Willie Thompson, you probably know, we're developing mm -hmm. um, a really interesting little history department and we're doing some really interesting things. And it, it struck me there examining the, the work that the students were, were doing, really, really good work, how much it was located in the city. I mean, lots of the dissertations that I was reading were about East End mm -hmm. of Glasgow or they were about, I think Elaine eventually had to ban uh, dissertations about Celtic football because there were just so many um, of them, fewer, fewer, fewer of my Rangers, as we said. But, um, but you know, flippancy aside, that that, that, that commitment to the locality, um, you know, which I don't want to be critical again of or, or implicitly critical of my own institution, but I, I don't think you see that. In Quite the same mm -hmm. way in a university like like Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but that's not to say that Edinburgh isn't you know strongly committed. But it's you know the, the university as an institution gets a lot of criticism in the city for being an elitist, being a bit separate. Um, you know, and the, the takeover of a lot of property in the city is, is, is seen as, as a bit colonizing within the city, whereas you know. Mm -hmm. like that would be very different. Oh, that's really useful way of thinking. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, thanks, Matt. And now, Linda, I think. Thank you, Linda. Over to you to ask your question. Th th thank you very much, um, and huge thanks to to Ewan for that very very thought provoking presentation there. Um, as someone who's recently retired from working in UHI, however having worked um, for, first of all, an academic partner and then UHI um, executive office from the late 1980s, you did bring back quite a number of um, really interesting memories. Um, and I would have to say that I agree um, very much with a lot of the analysis that, that you've got there. I think it's useful with hindsight just to look back on some, some of these experiences. Um, I am doing a bit of research into some of the related areas myself, which I'm quite happy to, to, to share with you. There is, just as you um, hinted at, just such a rich amount of material and so much thought still to go into that. Uh, just a couple of quick things I'd like to pick up on. First of all, I think it was Magnus that, that was um, talking about um, the impact of Objective One status. Um, of course, that did have a massive um, turnaround for a lot of the thinking that we have and uh, certainly a huge percentage of the Millennium Commission grant was used at that time as match funding which meant you, you were able to do a massive amount more. Um, so in broad terms, um, in fact, over the Objective 1 period and the subsequent EU programming periods, um, there, there, there was a hugely significant amount of investment in UHI's infrastructure, that's including a lot of the IT infrastructure as well as buildings, um, a lot of our learning and teaching, curriculum development, staff development, ton of other things <clears throat> that, that, that was enabled by putting that, that funding together. So of course that funding was very, very significant, but even more so was, was the way that that allowed and encouraged so much of the stakeholder development across the region and at wider level as, as well. Um, and there was mention of some of the links that we've had at, at um, European and international uh, levels there. Yes, there were a huge amount um, of interesting links with some of our Scandinavian partners, particularly those who were in similar regional circumstances to us um, up in more, more northerly, sparsely populated areas. And there was a huge amount of learning that went on um, at that level, which I would argue has influenced the way UHI itself ha has developed over the years. It's perhaps interesting to note, however, that there was as much of an interest if not more interest, and certainly you might want to argue um, a more positive interest in what we were doing in these early days in UHI from some of the, the, the European institutions. Um, I think we must have hosted visits from 
every single Swedish and Northern and Finnish university at some point over these years, and um, arguably mo most of the, the Icelandic institutions as well. And it was quite interesting to note just the massive enthusiasm and interest, perhaps sometimes even incredulity in what we were doing. And it was just worth noting that um, when we did eventually achieve um, university title, um, some of the first letters of congratulations we got were from some of these um, partners there. Uh, ju just one final point, if I may, Ewan. Um, I agree with your analysis of some of the turning points in, in UHI's history and some of the external factors um, that, that might have influenced that. One further one I would add on, um, perhaps throughout the, the late 70s and into the 80s, is the increasing recognition in policy terms of the role that universities have to play um, and should play in the development of regional um, economic and social and cultural development. Um, I think there, there, you know, there, there's a lot of literature around um, just a shift in policy, not away from looking at the the, the clear role of um, learning, teaching, and research for universities, but extending that role for, um, further into looking at what impact and and what benefits um, the university has to bring to the table when we're looking at uh, regional development. Um, so thanks very much for that. And I look forward to hearing a lot more as, as you continue with your work. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. That, that's, that's a really useful reminder as well. Yeah, I'm aware of some of that work, but it's, um, yeah, there is a lot of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, well, I think that might have um, exhausted our questions um, around the table and um, on VC. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. There is one final opportunity if anybody wants to, well, has something burning and pressing they, they want to raise now. Um, otherwise, we'll, um, we'll wrap this up. Okay, well, it would appear not. So it just remains for me to to thank our audience. Thank you very much, audience, for your interest in this talk and questions. Thank also um, Professor Neil Simcoe for his um, introduction and comments, and but perhaps above all to thank Ewan for his really stimulating and interesting and thought-provoking indeed um, uh, talk. Thank you very much, Ewan. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody else. I think that should be us ending the recording, Lindsay. Yes. Yep. Yeah.